My name is Lynn Twist. I'm the co-founder of the Pachamama Alliance. Yes. And I'm a proud member of the board of directors of Bioneers now. So honored to say that. <clears throat> Three years ago, in 2008, in the small country of Ecuador, a miracle occurred. Ecuador, a country of 14 million people right on the equator, is one of the most ecologically biodiverse regions on this earth. Ecuador is home to the vast Amazon rainforest, the high Andes, the Paramore, the cloud forests, the rich valleys, and beaches, as well as the Galapagos Islands. This is a country where indigenous people's voices are heard, where they're loud and they're heard and where they're central players in the political life and the destiny of that country. In 2007, a progressive, young, dynamic new president was elected, Rafael Correa, on a platform that his country was being governed under a constitution that was rooted in colonialism, extraction, and exploitation. And that if he got elected, he would call for a constitutional congress that would have indigenous people at the table, because it's their country, and write a new constitution, a 21st century constitution. <laughs> Out of that remarkable historic process in 2008, a new constitution was born. And that constitution is the first constitution in the history of the world that gives legal rights to nature under fundamental primary law. That's a Magna Carta moment for the 21st century and changes everything. Bolivia soon followed suit and that shot heard round the world from Ecuador and Bolivia has initiated a global movement for the rights of nature, the rights of Mother Earth. Forest systems, river systems, other species have rights in legal court in Ecuador and now also in Bolivia. At the heart of that breakthrough was our next spe speaker, Natalia Green. Natty is the Director of Political Plurinationality and the Rights of Nature at Fundacion Pachamama in Ecuador. Natty speaks fluent Spanish, French, English, Portuguese, and she was educated at Hampshire College in the United States, Flaxo in Quito, Ecuador, and at the Andina University. She has also been a leader in the Yasuni ITT project in Ecuador, an initiative in the central Amazon rainforest to keep the oil in the ground where it belongs. She is the president, president of Sedenma, which is uh, an affiliation of all 70 of the environmental organizations in the country of Ecuador. She is a young, dynamic, beautiful, passionate, strategic, clear, creative, courageous, unstoppable human being. She's beautiful too, and she gets it done. Her leadership at the Pachamama Alliance and Fundacion Pachamama in Ecuador is so effective that the president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, tries to hire her away from us on a regular basis. It is an absolute honor to work with her side by side. She's one of the most dynamic young people in the world. Please help me in welcoming Natty Green. Hola, Bioneers. <laughs> well, I don't have a common last name. I actually, my, my dad's from Chile, and that's why my last name is Green, but I think I was destined to work with nature. <laughs> thank you, Lynn, and thank you, uh, Kenny and Nina, for this amazing opportunity. And thank you to the Bioneers team for having me here. And of course, thank you, Bill, for always supporting me. It is really a privilege talking to you, to this really amazing crowd. I am thankful, thankful also that I got to talk right, right under the image of the condor, because what I'm gonna tell you is actually coming from my heart. While I was hiking a few months ago, thinking about pioneers, 
and thinking to myself what rights of nature really means, when reaffirming my stand and my commitment, I remember how standing I was when I was little and I asked my dad and my mom, really, you did not have TV when you were growing up? Then is when I realized that I will not be satisfied until my children, who are, not, who are yet to come, ask me, really, mom? Nature did not have rights when you were young? <laughs> this thought started bugging me a few year, a months ago after a conference here in San Francisco when Fox News broadcasted a rights of nature event that we held with the Pachamama Alliance and publicly satirized our work and said, can you believe these people going around saying that nature has the right to exist? <laughs> then is when I realized that this was one of the last frantic ditch efforts of a doomed dominant power. <laughs> of course nature has rights. If nature doesn't have a right to exist, then we can't exist. We are an intrinsic part of nature. We are nature. Latin America has been an exporter of nature. We depend on our natural resources more than other countries because our economies depend on the extraction and export of primary goods. You can say that due to this precedent, and because Latin American countries like Ecuador are still considered developing countries, it is not urgent for us to adopt climate change goals, uh, develop limits, or grant nature rights. But the truth is that especially in Ecuador, we are already exceeding our capacities. We are we, have we are reaching our limits of our environmental stocks. We have the second largest rate of deforestation in Latin America. And we occupy a really dangerous position on the threatened species country list. Our economy is based on the extraction of natural resources such as oil and mining. And unfortunately, these resources do not lie under the desert. They are located in one of the most biodiverse areas in the world especially under the amazing Amazon rainforest. We live in a world where environmental crisis is considered collateral damage, secondary effects, or environmental impact, where sustainable development is a popular term to justify destroying nature with no limits, and keeping, keeping a clean conscience where nature is something we humans contemplate for our own sake and satisfaction, and where we protect a species or an ecosystem that is threatened only because it's beautiful like a panda, or it's been proven to be useful for humanity. The deterioration that got enhanced during the 20th and 21st century shows that our disconnection with nature is abrupt. Cities are covered with cement, trash dumps and contamination is all over the place, desertification, flooding, overpopulation, pressure over nature. This should be looked with distress, but also with a lot of hope since we are the generation that everybody right now alive in this planet has a role in changing the tide. We can prove that this is a product of bad design, wrong concepts, and lack of information, but all of that can be changed. Ecuador is an example where there is a really active and engaged civil society, where indigenous movement and environmental movement has played a very important role on the protection of land, water, food security, and biodiversity against the big extractivism goals and the huge infrastructure projects promoted by the government with the wrong idea that because we're, an, we're a poor country, we cannot die of hunger sitting over a stack of gold. Our governments have not realized that our indigenous partners have been telling them long ago, our real wealth is over the ground, around us, and not underneath. After suffering the events of the worst oil disaster in tropical rainforests, uncovered by the honorable fight of, indig of indigenous Amazonian communities against the Chevron Texaco, being one of the most biodiverse countries in the world and demanding a change in our model of development, we, we came to recognize our indigenous base. The country voted for a president that offered change and most importantly, he offered the rewriting of our constitution. After a very participatory process, the majority of Ecuadorians voted in favor of a new social contract. In 2008, 
the most ecological and biocentric constitution the world has known was passed. And it is indeed the first constitution of the world that recognizes nature as a subject of rights. <laughs> rights of nature is not really a new concept. And it was not invented by Ecuadorians. Back in the time of Aristotle, he was already in the nature size, different from Calvin. Of course, there were thinkings like Descartes, who were coherent in stating that humans are not the only uh, animate beings, and they're the owners of everything that is inanimate. Spencer was not so tough. He said that we should tutor our inferiors and have some pity, especially with animals. Michel Serres had the thesis that we needed to a new contract that will include an agreement with nature. You all know deep ecology, and Ness already recognized the need for rights of nature. And theories such as ecofeminism reminded us that we cannot achieve a just society when women, nature, and animals are viewed as inferiors. <laughs> Aldo Leopold recognized that we do not need to use nature, that we need to use nature, but use it in a way based on principles like cooperation, community, and acknowledging our interdependence. Back to our times, many people know Christopher Stone, as the, and many people know him as the father of rights of nature after his well-known publication, Should Trees Have Standings, in the 70s. Others, like the Chilean Godofredo Stutzin, wrote about the ecological imperative in the 80s. Our friend Cormac Cullinan definitely opened our eyes on the perverse effect of the absence of nature in the juridical system in his book, Wild Law. We thank all of them for starting such an important debate, not only for rights of nature, but also for the role of us as part of nature. In 2008, 2007, while Equilus was rewriting our constitution, we got involved driven by the need and opportunity for change, trying to include collective rights and rights of nature into the constitution. I will not forget to acknowledge our colleagues from the CLDF, Mary Margin and Thomas Lindsay, who came to Ecuador and told assembly members that this was not a crazy idea, since they had helped more than 100 communities pass rights of nature legislation in more in, in a community-based level. The debate was on in Monte Cristi. Alberto Acosta and his team were advocating this idea, and we were all recognizing that a new, more democratic legal instrument, a constitution or a social contract, a carta magna or however you want to call it, will need to recognize and incorporate the voice of indigenous people and think of nature as a living being, as a giving mother. When trying to argue with really stubborn lawyers, it was useful to bring the idea of the Gaia hypothesis as an earth as a self-regulating system and as a simple host in this planet. Gaia is Pachamama, and Pachamama is our protecting deity that demands reciprocity. In philosophy, there is this a notion of immanent theology capacity, that what it means is our right to regenerate. Just as when we get hurt, we get regenerated, nature has a right to regenerate. But we have not given nature that time. We, cannot, we can live in Earth and in peace with Earth without being cruel and abusing other beings on Earth. Liberation theologist Leonardo Boff said that same relationships are based on the connection between life and inherent species, between the atmospheres, the oceans, the mountains, the land, the biosphere, and the anthroposphere, without the need of adding them but recognizing its organic intricacy. Symbiosis has proven how microorganisms cooperate to live and how predators end up killing the major cells and causing their own death. After a long period of discussion and rich participation, the Ecuadorian uh, Constitution recognizes that nature is a subject of rights and devoted a whole chapter to it. The whole chapter that you just saw has a really amazing uh, first part that I want you all to read with me. Nature Pachamama, where life is reproduced and achieved, has the right to integral respect of its existence, the maintenance and regeneration of its vital cycles, structure, functions, and its evolutional processes. 
let's cheer for that. <laughs> Rights of nature provisions are really transversal throughout our constitution, but most importantly, they are our reference point to achieve what we call well-being, or summa causa. That's the real important framework of our constitution. A new contract that is not based on a development model based on capitalism, because Leonardo Boff states that inherent competition in capitalism is the reason for its failure. What we need is a model based on cooperation and reciprocity, embedding the concept of well-being of the country we dream of. Endless accumulation has no future, and it is completely contradictory to life and life cycles. What is great about these fundamental articles is that it broadens the concept of nature. We're not leaving ourse limiting ourselves to the definition of nature as a biotic and abiotic elements of an ecosystem, but we are recognizing the rights of Pachamama, expanding the concept, not only to our humans, but also to incorporate relations society, and spiritual beings. We have not granted nature rights. We have only recognized something that nature always had, but we were too blind to see. So here's the big question. Are rights of nature implemented in Ecuador? One of our indigenous leaders, Blanca Chancoso, recently described our current situation like a tamale from Loja. She said that the government is trying to achieve a development model based on well-being and rights of nature. And he's telling indigenous people who know what rights of nature and well-being really is, that he's doing a well-being. And he says it's like a she says it's like a tamale. It looks like a tamale. You unwrap it, you unwrap the cover, and it smells like a tamale, but it doesn't really taste like a tamale. It's actually done with arena yeah, that is a really common flower, not the traditional flower. Our government still believes that we can respect rights of nature and still have a model that will invest in health and education with the resources that come from exploiting the oil and mining under the rainforest. Right now, the new center south round has been announced for oil exploitation. So yes, it will time, take time until the concept is contained in the context. And what this means is that we have a lot of work. However, even human rights are not fully respected still. And what this means is that we need to guarantee, all of us need to guarantee, the implementation of these fundamental rights. We need to learn to read nature, understand it, and know how to express itself throughout its changes. Internationally, we need to spread the word that we have more communities and countries recognizing rights of nature into its legal framework, because that's when change happens. We need to aim high and be bold. Think of our near future and think that we can demand a country or a corporation for a crime against humanity, against the planet, at an international court, because neither contamination nor nature restrains to the absurd current country borders created by war and colonialism. The Andean Amazonic constitutionalism, directly in Ecuador and tacitly in Bolivia, state that living as part of the Pachamama is vital for our existence and our well-being. We have been trained to dominate nature and dominate our inferiors and treat them as disposable people and disposable beings. But a new understanding is growing based on the need of a multidisciplinary, multicultural dialogue that needs to decolonize our minds. And why, if we recognize the need to evolve, why don't our legal systems evolve? All the apocalyptic messages of fear need to come to an end. People once thought that granting collective rights will destroy individual rights, that granting women rights will devastate families, that ending slavery will end up with free slaves killing white people, that ending apartheid will mean the disappearance of South Africans' white minority. That anguish needs to stop. Now, they are saying that nature is going to condemn us for eliminating a virus, or that we should be 
take an eruption, erupting volcano into court, even though it was our decision to build the city right underneath it. There is actually no dichotomy between rights of nature and development. As Mahatma Gandhi said, the earth provides enough resources for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. We need to understand the limits of our path through the planet. Why should we allow open pit mines when restoration is impossible? Why should we allow practices like industrial fishing that tears up the base of the oceans and throws back the dead, useless species? Why should we believe that such a, th a thing like drilling with high technology is real, when what it really means is how to extract faster and deeper without necessarily thinking about nature? Yes, it might limit property rights. If we understand property rights as the right to do whatever I want with my land, cut down the trees, burn, use pesticides, and endanger species and alter ecosystem cycles. We need to rethink our development. And what I mentioned is not the development I want for my country. I don't want that development. We need to rethink, as well, property rights. We might even think, re, want to rethink patenting, patenting animals and plants and seeds, because we don't own them. Why do we keep accepting arguments that destroy nature in the name of development, or use up our resources and tax money to solve the economic crisis of the rich countries, a, a crisis that we have not created, and spend millions of dollars uh, with a financial crisis, but allow them to use a crisis argument when it comes to cooperate with developing countries, pay their ecological debt, or compensate a country like Ecuador that is trying to permanently leave its oil underground, and compensate Ecuador to protect its biodiverse national park, Yasuni, and its non contact indigenous people. Nature just wants us to respect the cycle, restoration, and evolution. As Einstein said, insanity does not, does, is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Then why are we trying to reduce emissions without going to the real solutions, such as non-extracting fossil fuels and investing in free and alternative energies? For me, the Yasuni Initiative, for example, is the way to start that transition, different from other climate change mitigation mechanisms that don't really solve the problem. They only put a bandage on top of the wound. Big changes require bold efforts. The situation is so urgent that there's no time to waste. We cannot continue with environmental regulation that, as Tom Lindsay says, only determines how much damage we can cause to our slave. But it is not liberating la uh, nature or right recognizing it as a subject of rights. How can we protect our rights if nature doesn't have rights? Nature copes with its rights every day with its responsibilities, and maybe it will need our representation when it comes to the point of representing it and signing an agreement to protect a national a forest or an ecosystem. But we are not aiming to commonly own and administer an ecosystem, because that will be adding more title holders to a slave. We really want a free nature. In the work that we do in Ecuador, we're looking at the criteria and the indicators to fully implement rights of nature. I was struck with realizing that the real change of rights of nature is not its recognition. That's only one, one step. Sabino Walinga, who is a Quechua uh, shaman from the Amazon at the Inter-American Court of Justice this year, sat down and argued that the Sarayaku community was affected by the, the uh, explosives left underground in their territory. And you know how he said they were affected? He said that half of the spiritual beings had left their territory. <laughs> then is when I realized that if we really want to implement rights of nature, it is not only an issue of environmental regulations, but incorporating the intangible, the spiritual. Even if we're not indigenous, a campesino can realize that the land is tired. We have lost the ability to listen to nature, and we need to get back to it. Plus, we can not be so arrogant to assume that we understand nature, because we don't. We have no idea about the effects of the added impacts of our activities. Look at climate change. So instead of attempting to understand nature, 
why don't we just use na nature rights and, prevent, and the preventive principle to limit our impact on it? Conservation cannot be viable only if it's a good business. Valuing ecosystem services is useful for a transition from an anthropocentric society to a biocentric society. So people can understand the importance of nature. But that's not the right path. Different from the Endangered Species Act, we can preserve nature not because of its looks, value, or utility to humans, but because it has rights. Nature is not a, is not a commodity, and trees are not worth for their carbon absorption capacity. Plus, it is time to unite, to work fast and together. And we cannot afford to spend our energies discussing if you're against red or in favor of red. We cannot be divided. We need a real solution that will unite us all. And rights of nature is our glue. We need to recognize rights of nature not because it is a subject of rights, but because it's right. To reach a real earth democracy, we need, to, we need a universal legal recognition of rights of nature. From the logic of power, rights to subvert the status quo and become a tool to eliminate the privilege of inequalities of power relations is the legal path. We need to start using these tools. You know what, when something is nature, when nature is, is acting through you, when only over th uh, three years have passed, and Ecuador has already recognized rights of nature in its constitution. Bolivia called the first people's conference on climate change and rights of Mother Earth in Cochabamba, and everybody got talking about it. Even our government was forced to say, we have it in our constitution. In April this year, Vandana Shiva and Corman Kulinan were already talking about it in the UN. And I am now in front of this amazing crowd talking about how we can work together to cope with nature and work with nature. Nutrition rights came to place when people were undernourished. Equality rights, when there was exclusion. Rights of nature is nothing but inevitable. In this generalized crisis we live, abolitionists fought for slaves' rights, feminists fought for women's rights, we as environmentalists, parts of, part of a natural community, do not have other way, way that working for nature rights. Ecuador, as a small developing country, has given the first step. It is a magical place where miracles and transformation is happening. As an idea that came at the right time in the right place, Ecuador recognized rights of nature, and we need your help to make it real and sum up. That is why today, I brought to you some Wairuru Amazonian seeds. I don't know if you've, you have them already. Um, in spite that I had some problems and customs from bringing them in. <laughs> <laughs> they are called Wairuru. They come from the Amazon. And what I want is for you guys to take this back to your places and realize that you can apply and recognize rights of nature in your communities, in your countries, and help spread the word. We are now... Thank you. We are now celebrating one year of the existence of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature. Please become a member of the Global Alliance. Tell your friends and peers about it and write these rights into legislation to your, and to your local community. City or country, we can help you. We need to be innovative and creative. Go on and sign a petition so we can reach one million signatures for Rio Plus 20. And, <laughs> and incorporate your organization, your movements, any type of movement to rights of nature as a transversal idea. The police, Ecuadorian citizens have agreed upon a new social contract that recognizes nature as a subject of rights. The first step is the hardest. Then use the rights of nature paradigm shifter when you're looking for, for whatever you're looking for. And let's really work together this time to have the rights of nature as an idea whose time has come. Thank you very much.